Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Latest Shiny Podcast. I am your host, uh, Rob Hirschfeld with Rack N, and also Zeehicle Online. And we're here with one of my favorite guests, uh, somebody who can speak bare metal toe to toe with the Rack N team, which I love, Zach Smith with Packet.net. Um, go ahead and say hi. Hey, all. Um, this is Zach. Um, Rob, thanks for having me. It's fun to talk about metal with you. It's like legend on on amateur here, um, and I'll just try and keep up, all right? <laughs> I, Zach and I love to, you know, we, we are the fans of metal in the room, um, and uh, you want to give them a little background on, on what Packet does and, you know, why, why Packet does it, which I love. I love your origin story. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll do my best. Um, basically, we are a public cloud provider. Um, we automate single tenant bare metal compute for around 10,000 developers around the world. Um, we do so with as little software opinion as we can possibly get away with. Um, so we give our customers uh, as much choice as we can give them on operating system, how to boot their own, make images, um, boot OSs that we give them, bring their own network, bring their own IP space, control BGP routes, basically do everything except for rack and stack the metal themselves. Um, we're doing it out of 15 locations globally right now. Uh, we're a three-year-old company, uh, but I've been doing the metal on and off for about 17 years. So maybe that's the more interesting part is like, why would I possibly want to get into a public cloud business in 2014? That's probably a good question. I, I, I know part of the answer for that, which is it, people actually need this, right? When you started the company, Softlayer had just been acquired. We were watching a whole bunch of yep. big MSPs try and do metal. Um, it's super hard. Right? You and I both know this. Um, finicky, heterogeneous. Um, but you, it you should be easy, vision. but it's not. You had a vision, yeah, to, to make it much, much easier. And then you and I had a conversation that goes back to me, you know, even before, you know, you and I have been talking for before both of us started our, our various ventures. Um, and there's a price point for some machines where it is cheaper to run metal yep. than to run a VM. At least in the current marketplace, yeah. Um, I know we offer an eight gig RAM physical um, bare metal instance for five cents an hour, um, which on a per RAM basis, if that's what you care about, is one of the cheapest things you can get. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, metal is something that, uh, you know, we used to call it dedicated hosting. And that's what I started with in 2001 when I got into the Linux hosting world and uh, we were always um, optimizing. That was obviously pre most hypervisors. Um, so figuring out how to do that and, and make it go has always been part of my DNA. Um, but I think what made it relevant and why, you know, I certainly got interested in being in the space was just introducing the power of fundamental compute um, to a generation that had never physically walked into a data center. Um, so in 2014, you know, I was lucky enough in 2001, when I needed to get a server online, I walked into my friendly ISP and um, he helped me get it online and we, we racked it and he gave me some cables and probably loaned me a bit of money for the uh, HP deal, whatever I bought, you know, things like that. And you have to get it online, right? And you could rent Colo by the U at the time. And, um, you know, now there's just a whole generation that hasn't had access to that. Um, yet we live in a time where hardware is actually becoming increasingly more and more relevant. Workload is getting so big that, um, they're designing hardware, special silicon or offloads or whatnot around the software. Um, so maybe we're gonna go a little bit of um, snake eat its own tail, but I thought it was just an important, you know, next phase for my career to help, you know, a new generation, AKA a developer or a DevOps user access hardware without the abstraction of software layers. And it's, we've been watching this journey for a long time because we were, I think some of your very first customers um, very That's early right. on, we, sh we share an investor, uh, Jim Collis with, uh, I, I don't think he's investing with, in us out of Seaport, but um, somebody we, we both have a lot of respect for. Um, but even before Jim, I think you and I had been hooked up. Um, and we came in super early and started playing with, with your APIs when they were, you know, I think type ones were the only type available. And yeah. we built some nice automation. You were our first uh, cloud cloud infrastructure for exactly the reasons you're describing. 
uh, right? We wanted to play with hardware. We needed access to more servers than we had. Uh, and frankly, even though we're a hardware company, we don't well, want to- Let me guess, you, yeah, you, wanted, you, you didn't want to own the hardware. You didn't want to go muck around in the data center, but you wanted to control the whole thing. Exactly. And that's right. This is the, the irony for us is as much as we're helping customers run infrastructure, it's, you know, our job is their infrastructure. It's not, you know, racking and stacking servers any more than anybody else. So it's, just, it's an interesting need. And the thing that, that I keep coming back to now, especially now when I'm, I'm thinking through edge infrastructure and some of the interviews yep. I've done on edge, right? The, the idea here is that we're not talking about enterprise IT hardware, but it's the same server, yeah. but the way you're managing it, the way we're managing it, it's different. How's it, can you, can you encapsulate that difference? Well, I mean, it, we've been buying the same product under the hood. I mean, they look like pizza boxes still, right? Um, some way, shape or form. You got CPUs and NICs and hard drives and memory and all that kind of other j good jazz and you put an operating system on it. Um, you turn it on, give it some address space and call it a server. Um, but what we found, and I think that, that maybe is really coupled with this, is that you've just had a cultural change of people consuming um, infrastructure in a very different way. And I like to say that, you know, the software or sorry, the, the infrastructure of the future will be consumed by a developer or the software that she writes. And, um, you know, to that end, you know, how do you control um, software or sorry, how do you control hardware that's you don't even know how to boot regularly that sometimes does what you tell it to do and sometimes doesn't do what you tell it to do. And so I think especially as you get to whether it's edge infrastructure or as you know, a full DevOps transformation or just Ten availability zones, or you know, legal restrictions put in your gear in other places. I mean, whether it's metal or VM, you still got to consume this stuff programmatically. So, for me, it's not the gear that's changed so much. Actually, the gear has changed a lot less than we'd like it to. Um, and you know, that's maybe I'll save that for my rant topic, um, <laughs> Rob. But basically, the gear is the same. It's the user whose priorities have totally changed. And um, luckily, with this the blossoming of kind of portable software and great DevOps tools and techniques, people are able to consume hardware a lot more rapidly than we're able to give it to them. Um, so that's really our challenge to keep up with. And I think maybe that's, that's the big difference you're talking about. So, so this to me is the highlight, right? It's, it, this is a, a highlight that we just need to shout as loud as we can to the CIOs and the IT managers, because the developers and a lot of the ops people already know this. The cloud has forever changed IT operations in a way that makes the developers, right, write applications in a API addressable way, taught to them by Amazon. And I, there's other clouds out yeah. there, but Amazon is the teacher. <laughs> and people consume Amazon on that, or consume infrastructure on that model now. Yes. To me, when I look at Packet, that's the thing. It's like, look, I am, in, I am now consuming infrastructure in the Amazon pattern. I'm going to, I want to buy it from a lot of different people because I don't want a, a single vendor on, for this market. And sometimes I need hardware. Sometimes I need it on premises with my control, which is what we do, or I need it off premises when you do some on premises stuff too, or, you know, I need it in a very consistent cloud like way. That's, that's what's changed. Yeah, for sure. Hardware, VMs, who Hardware looks pretty much the same. I mean, TikTok cycles a little bit faster, more memory, more expensive these days, et cetera. But um, yeah, I totally agree that that's been the driving choice. And luckily, we, we do have a little bit more interest in the hardware world now. Um, I mean, the ARM ecosystem is no joke. Um, we have a, a legitimate choice in architectures this year between ARM, AMD, and Intel. Um, so if you're into it and you can take advantage of it, I think this is really what it comes down to is that over the next, say, 5, 10, 15 years, my kid just turned eight yesterday, and I've been thinking about it a lot. Right. And uh, yeah, go Wesley. And um, you know, that kid probably won't learn how to drive a car. And the workloads that are going to power that kid's life um, are going to end up on special hardware, full stop. It's going to get so big or so important or so distributed or so latency focused that it's going to be on unique um, hardware. And to think that that's all going to look the same, that it's going to be a generic x86 VM, I think is a little naive. Um, and so, you know, getting that experience from that AWS training wheels, right, and helping that to be addressable across machine types, across architectures, um, super critical. I mean, we can look at it 
whether people want to use offloads. And I bet actually a lot of people don't think they use offloads. And then you hear about, well, where does all the machine learning happen? Or where does all my routing happen? You know, so. And, and we're making, we're, we're getting better at making hardware easier. And that's, that's sort of the underlying piece with this, right? You look at TensorFlow and all of a sudden you're like, oh, GPUs are suddenly much easier to use because we have libraries and standards and processes that abstract the differences and then make them accessible. And yeah. I think that there's-, there's Software is doing a good this. job. Software is doing a good job at making hardware easier to consume. I think we have a long way to go in the hardware industry at making hardware easier to use. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I, as, as two people who deal with the, you know, how bespoke things get and how things are managed, some of it's unavoidable, I, I believe, right? Every machine has a Mac. Every Mac address is different, but has to be. Um, but yeah, oh my goodness, managing RAID and BIOS, trying to make that consistent, dealing with patches, rolling patches. I like a simple one. Where do you get your firmware? Where do you get your drivers? Oh, goodness. Who knows, right? I mean, that's the biggest Everywhere. question, right? Everywhere. So. The same vendor, multiple places, multiple ways. <laughs> And this is the how the innovation, but but the way you boot servers has been fundamentally unchanged, right, for 20, 30 years. Yeah. I mean, we're still supporting you know protocols that are you know very old, and they have to be really old because it's incredibly the inertia is incredibly hard. Yeah, but this user is changing it, and I think hopefully making us better. This user being um, the developer that grew up on AWS or the infrastructure manager um, is really teaching the rest of the ecosystem how it's going to get done, right? It may not live there. It may not look like that. It may not be virtual, but it's going to be automatic. Uh, it's going to be programmatic to some degree. Um, it, it, will awesome. it will have a CI CD pipeline. It will have A-B tests, right? This is This is what the data center... Of not, I mean, and I, people say tomorrow and it's like five years out. It, the data center of today, the ones you and I are helping build, the data centers of the day are CI, CD pipelined, right? Automatic deploys, you know, images that are, that are immutable being pushed through these pipelines and, and dropped into the infrastructure. Um, actually, that's a good tee up. You, you do a lot of CI. Yeah. Your infrastructure is the target of a lot of CI, including yeah. ours. <laughs> right. Awesome. I can test every 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 patch we su we submit goes against uh, packet servers to test. Um, you want to talk about that? That's a, it's an important part of this. Story. Yeah, I mean, we we I don't think we stumbled into it completely by accident, but we've been a little bit surprised um, with you know, how many projects use us for CI. Um, and it starts at the very bottom. So we do do some things as a company to promote um, multi-arch build CI. Uh, we do it for the Linux Foundation through CNCF. So we provide the compute clusters there. Um, we do it for most of the operating systems that you know and love from CoreOS down to, you know, more obscure things like NixOS or FreeBSD. And then we do it up the pipeline, um, Golang, um, uh, builds ARCH64 on us. Uh, Docker does a bunch of their builds on us. So keep going up. And what I think the reason why is beyond we provide access to a bunch of different architectures with a very consistent CI automatable process. You want to deploy your dynamic Jenkins slave. It just works, right? Um, whether it's a physical metal of x86 or one of ARCH64 or whatnot. Um, and it, it's really that we give people a huge amount of consistency. Um, and so when you're dealing with the physical metal, the biggest thing that we've heard back from our customers is that their CI runs are, you know, they just remove variables um, and they get to control their own image. They're booting their own metal. They've got complete control over the environment. Uh, they can guarantee the kernel that they're using um, and go through the whole process, you know, soup to nuts and destroy their environment and start all over again. So some users do it hundreds of times a day with us. Some you do it, you know, um, less, but uh, yeah, I'm super glad to hear that, that Racken is building uh, immutable software on Packet. It's a, it's, it's a big deal from, from our perspective, right? So and I'll give you a little customer story. Um, so in this case, I guess a mutual customer story, uh, right? We have somebody who wanted to take advantage of our Terraform to metal capabilities on, on their internal. So they're, they're not using Packet internal, um, but what they wanted to do is they wanted to build a Terraform plan that would, you know, be part of their CI pipeline. 
And so that means ultimately deploy on on-premises, but part of the CI pipeline can go to packet, and this is how we built the infrastructure to test those plans as part of CI pipeline mm -hmm. in addition to virtual machines, because there's a metal piece that they need to get right. Yeah, they, they need to test that part, otherwise it will be pretty janky. <laughs> right, so the developers use VirtualBox on their local machine to test the plan using local resources, and then they can pipeline it against packet to test it against metal, but not have to take a full-size server. And then when they actually go to deploy it, then they go to metal. So you've got this three different environments, nice. one type of, of pipeline. And this is this is. Are they even easy. doing it with their VMware while they're at it? Are they doing ESXi? They, they also, they, they do have a separate path to go to Amazon. Yeah, so, they, 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 so that's what they like about Terraform, even though it's yeah. not truly abstracted. There's not one plan. Yeah, there. no, that's great. Um, it's a totally that, good use case. That to me is where you're like, all right, this is how right, developers, operators, DevOps people, should be thinking if they're not, are thinking for the, the advanced users. Um, actually, what I find is the SREs and the DevOps engineers are thinking this way. Mm. The IT sysadmins, uh, y'all wake up. This is, this is <laughs> it, it, you're not, you can't do this on traditional IT process with tickets. It doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> no, not, not fast enough for these, uh the the software right not fast enough for those cycles and what's the most extreme that you've seen rob i mean like in terms of people deploying these pipelines in metal i mean is it like dozens of times a day or uh that's a good question the i'm still seeing there's still early days so everybody i'm talking to wants dozens of times a day i have a lot of conversations with people who want to get their redeploys down into sub five minute time mm -hmm. um, and we're doing some work uh, around Kubernetes that that's, should be driving that also. But um, you and I both know uh, getting the sub five minutes is hard because a reboot takes. Yeah, memory check sounds. <laughs> yeah. These things so, just take a little bit of time. So uh, you, you've got you know five minutes, less than five minutes to reboot a machine, you know, boot an operating system, uh, install an image into it, and then DD into the, and then reboot into that image. So you've got three minutes plus of reboot cycles, best case. You got two minutes of workable time to make that happen. Um, Let me just sneak preview into my no reboot install thing that we figured out, okay? I'll tell you about it later. Okay, you and I need to compare notes because we've got, we've, we've been doing some, some work along those lines. Uh, so what is, what is the coolest hardware that people are playing with in an automated fashion that you've seen? What's the weirdest stuff? Oh my God. You must have seen a lot. Uh, the, the coolest thing I saw was was not was exotic because it was liquid cool. Ah, uh, so just super dense or super dense uh, liquid cool type of stuff. Um, yeah, we've seen some weird. Greg's the one to get. Uh, Greg, our CTO, is the one to get on the phone to talk about mm -hmm. the weird stuff. Um, and you know, people trying to boot pies and nooks. And um, at one point, I played with a early. Uh, Freedom, uh, the original generation of Facebook uh, OCP stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, the ones without uh, out of band management ports. Oh yeah, <laughs> interesting. Uh, that was I still uh, need my I BMCs. Need. Yeah, no, it's I. They, that was a, a huge error not to have standard ports that you could out of band manage. They were using the uh, Wake on LAN reboot uh, packet. Um, which uh, for people who don't, we're, we're way down in the weeds, but um, PCs have a, have a way that you can, if it's enabled, you can turn the, you can send them a magic packet that forces them to reboot called Wake on LAN. Um, and that's what these original servers were using at, to avoid having to have a separate management, management path for machines. Um, it well, speaking, of, speaking about hardware, Rob, I mean, since we yeah. got a few minutes left, like in any customer or anybody who's listening to this or DevOps person or SRE or data center ops person, I mean, we're all talking about how to make metal super reliable and consistent and programmable and CIable and all that good stuff. But how do you get it in the racks? How do you order it these days? How do you ship it around so it can get imported into Hong Kong or India or London and somewhere else that you need to put it? Um, that, I mean, that's worth a discussion because we're all making it once it gets in the data center, right? And it's racked. But how do we get it easier into the data center? Any ideas there or what are people doing? Uh, they're relying on their colos in this case, or they take months 
to get things going. A lot of them are shutting down other data centers, right? They're, they don't want to run and rack gear. It's what we're seeing is a big consolidation play for people. <laughs> um, you know, so, and that's, you know, I know you have to deal with procurement issues. You have multiple types of hardware. Um, it's got to be insane to get those things. Yeah, up. we're in the logistics business, effectively. And I, and when you think about, I mean, if Amazon taught people how to, uh, how developers, how to use infrastructure or, or oh. DevOps people, um, it also just lent its incredibly um, sophisticated logistics capability to getting mm -hmm. servers into warehouses. Um, and we call the warehouses data centers, of course. But um, I think that that is one of our biggest day in, day out projects is just how to efficiently move hardware around the world into data centers. And we're a small company. And, you know, what we find is that there's just a long way to go that the customer shift of, um, you know, it used to be an IT person putting equipment into a local data center. Um, now that that is in somewhere a remote process, um, or at least a process that might require it to be in edge locations or multiple jurisdictions or whatnot, there's simply not the um, kind of scaffolding around to make that an easy, enjoyable process. It's painful, hard, and expensive. So, well, and this is where what I see people doing is relying on systems integrators. Um, I know a couple of them. I'm, I'm right. kind of to gloss out the pain there. They, and, and they'll ship a full rack and they're used to working with data centers or the colo providers, right? The, the every, people are, are trying to move up stacks. So mm -hmm. getting a colo provider who can procure racks as a relationship with a hardware provider and can get that stuff in and racked and going, um, that's a big, that, that helps. In some ways, that's not the thing that, that to me feels like it's slow. Well, and one of the things we try to help people with is they rack gear, there's mistakes, it takes them a long time to troubleshoot, there's right. a burn-in burn process, and so the idea that I can get my machines cabled, burned in, tested, and checked, our experience has been that often creates weeks of delays for people. Yes, getting your MAC addresses uh, tied up to your ports, and your yeah, cables tied up to your U location. You get you get somebody who, who didn't fully see um, yeah, <laughs> a cable, and then all of a sudden you've got inter, inter, intermittent um, intermittent networking or a drive's not seated correctly, and all of a sudden it's flaky. Um, hmm. Yeah, speaking of network, cable. how much of what, what Racken's doing these days is around the switch? Oh, that's a fun. Uh, we're talking to people about switch. Um, we're not there yet. That's a, a, that's an exciting thing. I know you all have quite a bit of switch automation because you turn on ports and you isolate customers. Um, and we've yeah, about them a little we bit. do that, but there's no like there's no simple answer yet. I mean, most of the switch operating systems are either you know very hard to automate or put you into a proprietary world that you're trying to get out of. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what other customers are doing. I mean, there's definitely been a lot of work in open source based networking, um, SDN, NFV work, et cetera. But in terms of just good data center switch, um, you know, you can buy the merchant silicon, but the OS and everything like that is still pretty hard to make. make so well. we've, we've got some really interesting patterns um, that we're just starting to publicize that don't require SSH to do some automation control side mm -hmm. pieces. Um, and you're looking for people who want to do that. I'll tell you, for us, there's a lot of people who want to come up and talk about us booting a switch or automating a switch and, and matching it. The mm -hmm. politics in most organizations do not allow a converged infrastructure. All right. Um, and so for the, for, since we were, since the very, Birth, you know, the, three years ago we started Rack, and we we've been trying to do this fully integrated switch automation, and we we talk to people about it, it ends up being well, I don't own that team, um, and right. and this is this that network team separate from server team separate from down. software team, yes, right, it 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 will in the edge, I I actually think what what we'll see is we'll see edge break it down first. Mm. Because when you're in an, a remote edge location, it's one thing, it's one unit, you've got to deal with it. Um, and then I think, um, and this is a much bigger topic, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll give, give you the hint, give the listeners the hint. Um, it, as we figure it out in edge, it will be, it will transform what happens in enterprise IT, right? The type of stuff you're doing, the type of edge infrastructures that we're talking about where it's, you know, uh, not a hardware converged infrastructure, but a software converged infrastructure. 
-hmm. those economics will will make it impossible for teams to stay split and inefficient the way they are today. Right? You and I are both changing the economics of the data center. So what's the most interesting thing going on in the DevOps world today? What tool is touching you the most? Is it Terraform? We are really excited about Terraform. Yeah. Yes. I, and I know you do a ton with it too. You, you see people spinning infrastructures up. That's, that's my tool of choice. It's so. Why not uh, Ansible? Not Ansible. Ansible, we do a ton with Ansible. Um, Chef and Puppet, not as much. Uh, Ter Terraform has been ex really exciting for us as we've been building um, uh, pieces on the back end. Uh, but uh, that's, not, that's not as exciting for us. I mean, it's, it's super exciting. We, we love to see people building infrastructures in an in a infrastructure as code way. Uh, the immutable deployment pieces are super interesting. So cloud and it base, I know y'all y'all have a really interesting cloud and it story where it's integrated into your service. Um, you announced uh, at Glucon, you were announcing um, some cloud init library studies, right? Yeah, we did some work around it. It's called init.hub.org, and it basically helps. And one of the things that we have such heavy usage of cloud init that people just managing their cloud init data <laughs> is becoming a massive problem um, and inheriting it appropriately. Um, so we released a, an open source tooling, a, a service actually, um, that, uh, that helps with some of that for people who are, I mean, we've seen people who are dumping, you know, 1,000, 2,000 line, um, oh uh, you know, clouded it uh, stanzas. So it's pretty big. <laughs> oh, that makes me sad. Well, we got away, we got away from, you know, I mean, they may be booting a core OS, they don't even put a puppet on it or something. And so they got to put everything into basically system D and, you know, boot it all with cloud in it. So, you know, it's got to go someplace. So this is, so one of the things, so we do that. And we're super excited to see that from a tech perspective and see mm -hmm. the pipelines and pieces together. Um, right, the, our, all our stuff is based on our open source digital rebar project. With that, we actually added um, a post provision control side. Okay. Um, that goes back to digital rebar from an instruction set. So it's, it's like cloud in it, mm -hmm. in that it's, it's simple post provision stuff, right? Post Cloud is just a like authentic. It, it, it doesn't have to authenticate, or how is it going to get this? Stuff? It it uses the token system that we built into Digital Rebar. So each okay. server only gets its instructions based on the the, the token. token thing. But what it can do is it can actually go back and say instead of getting just a cloud init file, it actually gets a job queue, and then it executes the job nice. queue. And yeah. so the job queue can change the job queue. Right. Uh oh. And so what happens is Boom, that then my head just blew up, Rob. Job queue can change the job queue. The job queue can change the job queue. So that that's workflow. So yep. now you crossed into the workflow boundary to say, oh, when I see this, do this. When I see this, do that. But or, if I see this, don't do this. Right. Yeah, nice. And so instead of it being this very static uh, cloud knit thing, it ends mm -hmm. up being being enough to do workflow. Now it's it, such I as such as I booted my server and my partitions aren't right. Instead of failing, it can be like go fix them. Right, and also give you back logs. So right. here's the log I got. Here's the things I see. And then the fun. So so we use it for doing things like oh I need to do burn in tests. Oh I need mm -hmm. to do network discovery. Oh I need to make some decisions based on how things are good. That's how our Terraform stuff works. Mm -hmm. um, and so it can actually drive a multi-boot, multi-staged workflow. So you can fix BIOS and then go into a new machine and then set the drives and do. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I mean, I, I feel like I'm cheating because I'm, I'm I'm of course super excited about the things that we're we're doing in open. Um, but they all the fun the fun thing for me is they all revolve around the tools that people are using. Right, this supports Terraform. It doesn't displace Terraform at all. It yeah. helps Chef and Puppet do their job. It helps Ansible. Like we generate dynamic inventory files out of Ansible, um, right? Everything we do because of this is the to me the hybrid cloud pattern is it's all about how do we reuse tools that people are comfortable using? Yeah. Not, right, right y'all didn't build a cloud formation. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. Just how do I make user data awesome. work so that you can do Terraform? Well, you know, Rob, um, it, your, your life cycling or your workflow on hardware, you know, right now, what do you do if you've got your self-encrypting drives or whatever? Well, you watch the boot process and you enter in the key, right? Um, 
and uh, you know you're adding workflow to handle kind of complex and more nuanced processes like that. You know, it kind of reverts me back to which we would think is pretty silly today, but in about 2004, I spent some time in going back and forth to China, and I went to a data center in in Beijing, North China, and they wanted to show me their NOC, uh, where they did managed services, and they had about 100 people sitting in front of um, you know little LCD screens refreshing web pages to monitor them. So, you know, I mean, that's the analogy of what we generally do in IT systems today, right? So uh, we're just doing that to like install our servers or get those self-encrypting keys in there or after the first reboot, make sure to do this, right? So amen to workflow, amen that's to the, automation. <laughs> it, it, the amount of time when we talk to a customer who's like, all right, yeah, I open a ticket after this happens. Like, can you open a ticket to change the network port after your server's booted? And it's like, because you need to what? Well, somebody has to change the networking after the server boots. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I get it. ServiceNow ticket. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, ServiceNow and Jira got to have a business, right? So. <laughs> That's true. That's true. We got to support the cause. And 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 this is what's fun, right? Those those to me are are start crossing into orchestration or you know company process. And yeah. You still want to? You still need to do those things. So listen, Rob, you coming to New York soon? Because we got a good thing going on November first. It's all about the metal. Run cloud native oh, on metal. You gonna come? So I love this show. I wish I could get there. I'm I'm gonna be en route to uh, OpenStack Summit. Uh, that that day. In where? In in Sydney? Can't make it in Sydney. Oh man, yeah. you, you need Elon Musk's new rockets or something because you're Ooh. definitely not making it back. Yeah, both. You're right. You're right. I could just <laughs> I could loop through. Um, and so tell it tell so I'm not sure this will air before that event. Give people a sense of what this is and, and what, what they missed. And why they, why they should care. We didn't need, I'm gonna try and get this on air before, but Okay, well I mean if 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 y'all are listening and that's just I did that for you, Rob. Did you get it? Y'all are listening. Uh, um it's uh Where's your hat? Yeah, I don't see the it's at right home. Now. Uh, November 1st here in New York, uh, downtown Manhattan, LMHQ. Um, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is putting on an event called Cloud Native in the Data Center, Why, How, and Who. We're basically talking about a couple of different operators who are running full cloud native stacks on metal in their own data center and one who's not. Um, so basically it'll be Sam Kotler who runs SRE at GitHub talking about how their metal orchestration works and how their Kubernetes story has been. Um, Raj Dutt who runs Grafana Lab and people um, that like Grafana uh, and they run a mixed environment between GCE and, um, and packet metal. And then also Sarah Walker, who heads um, engineering at White Ops in the uh, very latency specific um, ad tech world. So it's gonna be a good talk. We'll also have a couple lightning things, some really, really, really nerdy stuff. One is gonna be a soft from uh, Mellanox talking about high performance networking within Kubernetes clusters. Um, and then also Amir from Iguazio talking about serverless with like microsecond latencies. Wow. Using hardware. So that is the SRE event. Of November, or at least of November 1st. And we're doing an experiment. It's going to be cool. You got to pay oh, like $2 this. for this event. All right? But we will give you $2 back. And if you're lucky, we may even give you a $2 bill. They're going to be special $2 bills. Get your subway fare back home. At least we'll know how much beer to buy, basically. I, I think this is smart, right? It's a token, literally a token fee. And... Uh, if you that don't show is, up, I'm keeping your $2, okay? That's yeah. my, my side job, all right? My, my insurance plan. The frustration, you know, uh, that I hear across industry of this, you know, it costs nothing to sign up for a meetup or an event. I, I put my name in it and I don't show. I really never even intended to show, but I liked it on my calendar because I look smarter. Uh, well, you know uh, what? We're, we're, we're going to change how you consume metal and this whole, like, drop-off ratio at meetups, okay? Two bucks to register, but we'll give it back at the door. I love it. Yeah. I love it. That's good. Where else can people find out about packet.net? Uh, well, you can go to packet.net. Um, you can read about us there. Um, sign up, try it around, run your CI pipeline, boot your own OS, muck around and try and break the hardware. But not too bad. Let us know if you do. <laughs> they are super responsive. They'll, they, they ping you all the time. All the time. <laughs> Some, sometimes, and, and Zach's newsletters are great, funny, 
Um, and I'm always impressed with how fast you're bringing up infrastructure and adding pieces. So that's awesome. All right, Rob. Well, thanks for being that's a cool. customer. Appreciate thanks the for time. having me on the show. Awesome. Thank you. Talk All to right. You soon. Take care.